Good evening, everybody. This is Darius Asemi, uh, your host on GV Wire. Uh, welcome to another episode of uh, Unfiltered Live, coming to you from Fresno, California, along with my co-host, Steve Randa. Happy New Year, right? Happy New Year. Yeah, it's our first show <laughs> there in you go. 2023. Okay. Is it 2023 now? No, it's 2024. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the wrong year. We were joking around There's earlier. a lot of folks who want to skip 23. <laughs> right. Okay. And Mike Rabazzi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good evening. Good evening to all of you. Uh, uh, we have a very fascinating show for you tonight. Uh, we're going to switch things up a little bit. Uh, but before we get to our show, we have a poll to put up. Will the California drought end in 2023? And uh, where are we at with our, okay, let me see. There we go. Uh, will the California drought end in 2023? And will uh, the governor actually re re end all of the water restrictions? I don't think we can put, as, as the audience is not seeing the poll. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they seeing it? No, those people right now. Okay. You, you know, one of the nice things, Darius, if you, I haven't seen the mountains and the coastal ranges okay. in a long time. The air is so clear. It's clear yeah. to me. The restrictions have to go. Let's make sure <laughs> Sacramento <laughs> thinks it's clear too. Yeah, a um, lot of water filling up our lakes, which is awesome. Yep. But will the California drought end in 2023? Uh, majority, slight majority of our audience said no. Um, we're going to have another poll for you. Should the governor? Remove all rest water restrictions. Like what does that mean? You can you can water uh, on you clean. can irrigate your front and rear backyard. You can't lawn. do that now. You can't do that. Now. <laughs> no, 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 I'll give you I'll give you an example. Why it's, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why it's. <laughs> you didn't know that. I didn't. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, we were under the city of Fresno rules. So the city of Fresno rules, but it's really coming coming down from uh, the state. Let me explain why that matters to people here in Fresno. If you have a ponding basin or a flood control basin in your area, you notice a lot of it's dry. So when you're looking at you have a nice manicured lawn and across the street, there's a ponding basin that looks like crap. Part of it is statewide regulations. We are not allowed to water the top of those basins. That comes from Sacramento. So if we can change that, we can have nicer neighborhoods. But there you go. those restrictions keep us from beautifying our own communities here locally. Oh, gotcha. So what do you, what are our, what are our thoughts? I don't think just one fantastic year. As a matter of fact, last year at this on this day last year we had even more water than we do this year. But then the end of January started fading and then we didn't get any more. So um, hopefully it, it go, keep continue stronger. It looks like we're going to get more rain this week. But I don't even think just one year is going to correct the kind of problem that we've got ourselves into. And then I'm one of those that believes that most of this drought is a man-made drought. Correct. So in some ways, it's got to do with the water, but in many more ways, it's got to do with the management of the water. And so, is that going to change? Water equals growth, equals more folks. And there's a lot of folks uh, in Sacramento who don't want to see um, more people moving into California. Okay. Are we going to, Mike, anything on that? No, anything it just it, go, okay. it goes beyond water policy. Look at the transportation policy. We want to put a fourth lane on 41. We can't do it. Why? Sacramento says no. They don't want more cars. Yet they want us to drive electric vehicles. How does that work, Darius? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no. That's a really good point. No more capacity enhance. You cannot expand or enhance the capacity of the freeway system. People should be walking alongside the freeway, <laughs> bicycling, <laughs> bicycling, skateboarding, skateboarding, skateboarding on the, on the freeway. And mass okay. oh, anyways, we'll move on to the next segment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Last item well, on this. Well, I was going to say mass transit has actually gone down. Ridership's gone down because you learned in the pandemic having a bunch of people on a bus isn't safe necessarily. People like their cars. And we have, like, I have an electric car. You have a hybrid car, Steve. Yeah. We're doing our part for the environment. But I don't want to have to wait forever to drive down the 41, for example. They, because And, and not, not all of us are going to. Uh, here's the challenge. And we're going to move on because we've got a big show uh, waiting for us. Uh, Central California is low density. Uh, we're not San Francisco, we're not parts of San Jose, and mass transit works really well when you have high density. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you've got to spend a lot For of sure. money getting people around. And, and hey, we didn't, don't shoot the messenger, but we just, Fresno, Clovis, most of Central California is built on medium density, medium to low density. So, um, <clears throat> okay, let's move on to our next um, segment, which is what's happening with uh, the Speaker of the House, 
who's going to be our next speaker? Uh, Representative Kevin McCarthy, who, which represents Fresno, by the way, all the way down to Bakersfield, is having a hard time getting enough, garnering enough votes. I think it's from your side of the aisle. It's, it's coming from <laughs> it's this right over there. Over the good there. guys. <laughs> the, the ultra conservative guys. Uh, he can't get them corralled in to get the, the votes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, he, he lost three three different attempts today, right? It's like the first time in... Over 100 years? 100 years or yeah. something. We have Alex Tavlian on. He's going to correct it. He, he'll, he'll get us all dialed right. in. Yeah. Okay, Alex. Let's put Alex on and, uh, and, and what we have on the slide. Um, that is not Alex. That's David. Hi, David. <laughs> That's Here's Alex. Alex. Okay. Hi, guys. <laughs> How you doing? Doing very well. Well, not as not as well as Kevin McCarthy or House Democrats certainly uh, tonight. <laughs> Tell us about uh, your perspective on what's happening with uh, the speaker again. That is David. Not there. We go. That's Alex. Okay. Uh, tell us about uh, what you see. What what could happen in the next few days? This is kind of unprecedented. Uh, what, what's happening? Uh, we're going to go to a fourth vote here soon or what are your thoughts yeah, i mean right now the house is in recess and they're expected to reconvene tomorrow um currently the republican leader kevin mccarthy is negotiating with what has been branded the the detractors the you know the the house freedom caucus and some of their members um you know we're looking at the potential for a fourth vote um the big question is what's the breaking point at, at what point are Republicans going to say enough and, you know, either get in line behind McCarthy or find an alternative that can get 218 votes. I mean, that's that's the bottom line right now. That's where things stand. That's what three rounds of voting has kind of left. That's where it's left the party is they don't really know where, you know, they don't really know where they are. They don't know what it's going to take to flip. You know, they, they need to flip 15 or 16 votes towards either McCarthy or another candidate in order to secure the speakership for a Republican. Um, you know, we had today, we had between 19 and 20, to, you know, Republicans not voting for Kevin McCarthy. And, and at one point, it, the, the numbers actually went up between the second and third ballot because you had a Florida member decide to vote. Uh, he committed to vote for McCarthy for two rounds. And then the third round, he decided, you know what, I'm gonna vote for someone else because it's clear he doesn't have the votes. And so he voted for Jim Jordan, who ironically is endorsing McCarthy for speaker. So there's there's a lot of consternation within the Republican conference. But in fairness, this has been a long time coming. This is the chickens coming home to roost after, you know, 12 years since the Tea Party you know, revolution in the House amongst Republicans uh, between a fight between establishment Republicans and the more insurgent, you know, hard, hardline conservatives. Florida. to make where McCarthy stays speaker, but he makes certain concessions to them. Is that even I mean, it, a possibility? It, 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 I, mean, I mean, it's possible. Is it likely? Not really. Uh, you know, we've never had a bro. I got it. Uh, we, I, we, sorry, folks, we're getting some technical difficulties. Uh, 2023 is not starting off well. Yes, there's sound. There's sound. There's sound. You can continue. There's sound. Okay. 
so the, it, it's possible, but highly unlikely. And the reasons why are simple. Um, you know, having a Republican speaker who is beholden to Democrat votes to stay in office um, is an untenable position for that speaker. Uh, and so the likelihood of a brokered, you know, even if you had a coalition government where you had moderate Democrats, moderate Republicans merge together and vote on a speaker, that speaker's position is always under threat. And all it takes is a few disgruntled members and a motion to vacate the chair. And that guy's gone. And so the, 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 I think the situation currently where you have no speaker and the House is not seated, ironically, is preferable to having an unstable speakership beholden to really contrary and and uh, conflicting interests at the same time. So I think a lot of folks are, there isn't a lot of drive amongst Republicans to cut a deal with Democrats. Pretty much have them, pardon my language, by the balls. Yeah, really what, what McCarthy is trying, I think he, at, the old, at the end of the day, he's trying to come with, up with, uh, he's trying to put them in a corner on two fronts. The first is, what are your demands? What do you really want? What can I satisfy you with in terms of a deal? Do you want committee chairmanships? Do you want better seats and committees? You know, are you looking for better processes? Chip Roy of Texas said he really wants a more transparent budget process. Um, you know, what does that look like? Number one, and then number two, it's a political opportunity to put a lot of these very hard right members in a box. And say you have the chance to either advance our position and actually show that you're committed to countering the Biden administration and probing, you know, the intelligence community and the FBI, or you're not, and you're with the Democrats. You're just supporting their agenda, but you're doing it in a backwards fashion. And so, uh, either way, you know, I think one of the best things that could happen for McCarthy is by forcing guys like Matt Gates and Lauren Boebert to have to vote for either him or Hakeem Jeffries, you know, the Democrat. Um, because that's that just makes, you know, Gates and Boebert bigger targets to very conservative Republicans because they have to own a record that is prompted by Democrats. Alex, I have a question for you. Uh, what are the odds of a Democrat becoming the Speaker of the House? It, it's not impossible. And I think that's the more li I think that's a, a likely route. There was a lot of conversations today on the floor between Paul Gassar, who is a major conservative, you know, arch conservative pushing for this and uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And, and one of the big questions was, is there any view amongst the Democratic caucus that some would flip and either not vote president and basically be an abstention on, on these speaker votes, uh, which would lower the threshold McCarthy would need to get, or were there gonna be Democrats voting for McCarthy to get him through? And, and the answer of course is no on, on both counts. Um, and that's the, the big thing. And the reason why this is maybe the more likely scenario is that members like Matt Gates have intimated, they're not, even, they're not even implying it, they've said it, that in some instances, Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leader, is preferable to McCarthy. And they would much rather have McCarthy, they would much rather vote for Hakeem Jeffries than vote for Kevin McCarthy. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard that yet. Um, so what would it take for the Democrats to uh, have control of the House? Even though well, they current, have the Republicans have the majority, we know that by like ten, by like ten members, I believe. What would it take for the Democrats to gain control of the speakership? So right now they have the Republicans have a, a four member majority. They have two hundred twenty two members. Two hundred eighteen is an outright majority. So they, they, you know, McCarthy has a margin of four votes he can afford to lose at any time. Um, the fifth vote is always what kills him, and, and it's what killed him in three ballots today. Um, for Democrats, they'll need to pick up about 10 to 15 votes in order to secure the speakership for Hakeem Jeffries, the, 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 the minority leader. Um, and, and again, there, there is a route given the size, you know, we have currently a caucus of 20 members, 20 Republicans who are not voting for McCarthy. So a path does exist where they could defect and go vote for a Democrat. It would be very politically perilous, but it's possible. Right. So... It's been 100 years since there's been a second ballot or third ballot, so it's kind of an unprecedented time. I have another scenario for you. There's no requirement in the Constitution that the Speaker has to be a sitting member of the House. They could always go back and pull someone like Paul Ryan or a previous Speaker or any other Republican that would unite them. The question is, is there a candidate that could do that? I know it's a crazy scenario. Is there a candidate that can unify, that has that ability? And do you guys have can dream, dream scenario candidates you think would be to do that? 
Yeah, I mean, certainly there, uh, there, there I'm, I wouldn't be shocked if there was a large contingent of of Republicans that wanted Donald Trump to be speaker. And that's been thrown around before, after he lost the presidency. Um, and even, you know, and, and even during this last election cycle, people said they would vote for Trump for speaker. You've got former members who have a lot of clout amongst the very conservative ranks, but also the moderate ranks. I mean, one of them happens to be from this neck of the woods. I mean, you've got a guy like Devin Nunes who carries a national profile, um, you know, who is not a member, but has been in the trenches with a lot of these guys. And, and could be it could be a figure like him or, or uh, you could have a Paul Ryan, a little more establishment figure come in. But at the end of the day, you have to whoever if you're going to take an outsider in as a speaker, which has never happened. I'll, I'll note that if you're going to take an outsider into the speakership, they've got to be able to, to manage both the establishment you know, basis of the of the conference, but also the insurgent conservative uh, portion as well. Mm. That's tough, tough job. Okay, anything else before we go to what's happening in the hospital world? Well, I guess we'll just keep our eyes on this, right? Uh, to me, it seems like, and I get I get that there's some, that folks are upset with Kevin McCarthy. There's people that are upset with everybody. But my question is, what I and I've heard other people ask it, so it's not original my question. But what is your plan? If you guys don't like McCarthy, what is your plan, right? And, and it seems like they're having a tough time coming up with that. Yeah, and I think that Alex mentioned that earlier. I wonder, as, as, a, as a Democrat, I'd be pouncing on it saying, you guys are holding up this country, this process, and you don't know what you even, what you even want. Oh, um, Mike, that's not going to fly with conservatives because every day that they're not working is a better day in America. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you guys a question. Do you have a, 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 a Republican candidate you think could be picked out, maybe someone you know that can come in here and, and do a good job if they were to choose an outsider or maybe a former speaker or a former a member of Congress? See, you're asking, so you're asking me, and I'm, and I'm over there in that right side of that sure. political aisle, sure. right? And so one of the problems is, so, so this is the way we would look at it as like, and I like Kevin McCarthy. I've met Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we've already been there, done that with all the Paul Ryans, John Boehner's. We've kind of, that whole establishment, I'm willing to get along thing, um, that has kind of been the Republican um, strategy for a long time, and we've been getting our asses kicked. Right. So now the Democrat Party is getting much more intense. If you look what they're doing, they're getting much more intense. Oh, no, the progressive wing, I mean, they, they've really driven the party to far left. What makes it very difficult exactly. for people like me. It's very, very hard. So, stuff so the response yeah. in the Republican Party is to move away from the Paul Ryans and the John Boehners and the Kevin McCarthy's and look for somebody that will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Democrats, right? And <clears throat> the feeling is that the Republicans don't fight. So we want basically, what you're saying, some of these Republicans want split we're going to go after you. You come after us. We're going to go after that's, you. That's already happening. We're not going to get anything done. That's already the case. I, I, I get that. Yeah. I get that. So yeah. we're going to have a gov what do we call it? Impotent government. Yeah. But if it's not yeah. McCarthy, we don't have a local speaker. I mean, Pelosi was from California. Maybe that made a difference. But he's right in our backyard in Clovis. I mean, if we don't get McCarthy, I understand he's a Republican. But that may bring a lot of dollars here locally. Hey, I, I totally agree. Uh, who was the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee about 10 or 15 years ago that took, brought a, he was from Bakersfield, mm. brought a billion dollars to infrastructure in Bakersfield. Uh, can't think of his name right now. But no, Mike, you make a great point. Uh, McCarthy is in our own backyards, uh, California, especially Central California, in my opinion, will get a, the spotlight in terms of services, potentially dollars, if he becomes a speaker. Uh, if there's nothing else on this, Alex, any final comments from you? Pop more popcorn. There's a lot more fun to be had in the next couple of days and possibly weeks. What's the spread? Do you have any bets on this? <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the hospital crisis. Um, we have two outstanding guests uh, uh, for you guys. Michelle Von Tersch, Senior Vice President of Communications and Legislative Affairs at Community Medical Centers or Community Health Systems. And also David Bocci, Regional Vice President of Hospital Council of Northern and Central California. But before we bring our guests in, tell us. Yeah, uh, I would like to tee this up tell if us, I could. Tell us, you, you brought this up on what you guys are doing uh, yeah. as a Board of Soups. 
Uh, yeah, this so has started coming across uh, my desk last week. Uh, with conversations with um, our department heads and our CAO, Paul Nerlin, had given me a phone call and saying, hey, our department heads are, lo are looking at declaring a state of emergency. They're getting a request from uh, the community medical systems. And so I said, okay, you know, what's this all about? Who can I talk to? What's the background? And one of the triggering components, Darius, and I think a lot of uh, unfiltered uh, viewers have heard about this, is that uh, Madera had a hospital that shut down. And it looked like it was going to be salvaged. There was an attempt to salvage, keep the doors of this hospital open. Um, but the attorney general stepped in, got involved in the negotiations, and everything went kaput. And the hospital is in the process of shutting down. And so how, what is, how does that lead to an emergency? Well, our hospital system here locally in Fresno County, I would say, or the city of Fresno, but our local hospital system's already maxed out. And now we have a neighboring hospital that shuts down mm -hmm. in Madera. And so what does that mean in reality? From my understanding, from my phone calls, looks like there's about 13 ambulances a day that used to go to uh, used to go to Madera that now come to Fresno, right? Wow. So you know that's an impact, and that's just the emergency side of it. Then there's the regular folks that it's not quite an emergency, but somebody else drops them off at the door right. of the hospital. Um, now, will that impact uh, downtown community CRMC more than St. Agnes or other? That's my assumption because my biggest worry, Steve, is my residents live in Northwest. St. Yeah. Agnes is right there. Communities down the night off the 99. Is it going to be harder for them? Great to get question, seen? Mike. And one of the and one of the folks that I talked to was Todd Valari with American right. Ambulance, right? And he said that typically about 60 percent of those outside um, ambulance trips would come to downtown Fresno. Okay. So if there's 13 of those new trips, additional brand new trips, 13 of them, 60 wow. percent, you know, eight or nine of them are going to come to downtown Fresno, right? So is there extra bed space and i think that's what we have on uh, michelle and david to talk to us about so i have a couple more comments but that's what i wanted to tee it up with that that's great so let's bring uh, michelle and uh, david on um let's start let's put both of them on please and let's start off with uh, david uh if you want to give us a I, actually i have my own question for michelle and why community health systems which, which is which is a fantastic <clears throat> healthcare provider in Central California does fantastic things. We don't know what you, we, we, where we would be without you guys, both, both in your awesome Clovis location and your downtown location. We're really proud of the work uh, you guys are doing. Um, and and where, would we have, where would we be without you and why you guys are not buying Madeira. Uh, but before we get there, uh, David, um, uh, could you comment on how how, how did this come about? How did this happen? And what is the impact to our local residents? Like, like uh, Steve said earlier, the system is already maxed out and, and strapped before the hospital closing down. Now the stress on community health systems, St. Agnes, Valley Children's, et cetera, et cetera, is going to be even substantially more. How did this come about? And what is, um, you know, the hospital council of Central California's role in addressing this, um, and what solutions do you see? Uh, thanks, Darius. Um, so, um, so the role of the hospital council um, is really to convene the hospitals together and advocate for the hospitals. And what we're seeing happen in Madera community, um, it's not new. What This is a process that's been years in the making. And the COVID pandemic really accelerated uh, and added fuel to the fire of some structural issues um, that exist within the entire healthcare industry that are not specific to that one hospital. And so um, really with COVID, uh, it changed the way that we staff. It's changed the number of nurses we have available at all hospitals, not just in Madera. Um, our pharmaceutical costs on average have gone up by about 41%. Medical supplies have gone up by about 19%. And all the while, this is not a restaurant where if our costs go up today, we can raise the cost of our food tomorrow. Um, the rates that we can get reimbursed and hospitals can get reimbursed are set sometimes years in advance. And when it comes to the Medi-Cal program and a lot of uh, the patients in the Valley use, use uh, Medi-Cal, 
those rates were set in 2012. And so we're operating in today's financial environment with 2012 reimbursement to cover our costs. So what we see in Madera is it just doesn't work any longer, especially for these small community hospitals. Um, so what's the impact? The impact means that um, from a health equity perspective, depending on your zip code, you don't have a hospital any longer. It now takes an extra 30 minutes to get to a hospital. And I think all of us, uh, if you watched Monday Night Football last night, we saw what happens when someone goes into cardiac arrest. Seconds matter. A life is saved in seconds and minutes, not in half hours and hours. And so this has a profound impact. Um, as you said, the hospitals that are in Fresno County, they're struggling with all of the same exact issues uh, that came to bear on Madera, and our hospitals are already too full for the number of staff that we have to treat them. But all of these people now are going to be coming into Fresno, and rightly so, they need care. Uh, but it's just really a tragedy of, of what's happening with the healthcare system. Uh, and unfortunately, our local community in Madera is bearing the brunt of that. So David, let me ask you a follow-up question. Uh, millions of Americans, now that the pandemic has subsided, are going to be taken off Medicaid nationwide, including California. Now, we're a little bit different here, but have you factored in the impact of those patients and reimbursements and costs into this scenario? Is this just another another uh, chink at the armor? Um, um, taking people taking off, people of, off of, of anyone losing insurance, and, and yes, that is going to happen when the federal emergency uh, is pulled back, it just makes things harder. And so uh, I think that uh, when Michelle talks about her perspective from, from one hospital, uh, all of these things add up. And I think that um, really the COVID pandemic and now what we're calling this, this triple-demic, all of this is death by a thousand cuts, but these cuts have come fast and furious for three years now. And this is just another cut that is going to, to really affect the system. Um, and so what's the result? It's people still need care, people will still receive care, but how do we actually have the funds in order to run the hospitals? Uh, that's the big question mark. Uh, a couple of comments online uh, is about I, I, what Mike really, uh, and you just discussed, is about reimbursements and more patients on Medi-Cal and they don't pay. Is that correct? From so... I want to. And, 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 and did this all start with Obamacare? I disagree with that point, but we'll talk about that. We're, we're, okay, good. Uh, David can hopefully shed some light on that. Yeah. So, yeah, so really, the the whole point of the Medicaid system, which Medi-Cal is part of, is to make sure that people have insurance, and that's fantastic. And so many of the patients who we work with in the Central Valley rely on this insurance. And what we're pointing to is not an issue of a patient pays and, and a patient doesn't. It's actually more of a structural political issue of the government setting the rates that hospitals can be reimbursed, but freezing those rates uh, for a world that existed 11 years ago. And we're just not in that environment anymore. Inflation alone has increased dramatically in the last uh, 18 months. So it's not so much an issue of that. Um, what is the root cause of it? It's not something that we can point to any one policy as the cause. This is a combination of dozens and dozens and dozens of different policies and different financial realities um, that really exist that are all coming together in this really complex situation um, that affects our families really directly. Uh, I got a quick question and then we're gonna go to Michelle. Uh, big pharma, I mean, pharmaceuticals go up and price every year, 5%, 6 10 11 uh, So I guess, is, is it fair statement to make the, the uh, big pharma has a much more powerful lobby in Washington than hospital groups do? You know, I think it's an interesting question. There certainly is a lot of, um, a lot of power with a lot of different groups. I don't know that I can say that one is stronger than another. Um, I do think that what we can really look at is the pharmaceutical industry produces products, which are our medicines, which are incredible and life-saving, and we want to keep those coming. The hospitals, by contrast, aren't 
we don't have new and flashy products to share, which can catch attention and get people excited. Our, the assumption is we're always here. And so it's a little bit of a different game, even though they work hand in hand, it's a little bit of a different mechanism that's happening here. Um, and I think what Madeira is showing us is there's no guarantee that this hospital is always going to be here. And so we really need to be paying attention to what the situation is. David, hold tight for a few minutes. We're going to bring you back in. I want to uh, bring Michelle into the conversation. Michelle, when we voted on the Board of Supervisors uh, this morning, uh, you know, one of the driving factors was community and the voice of community, which is just like this big, um, uh, massive part of our local healthcare system. And so community was there asking, you know, for a declaration of emergency. And we heard about uh, 30 people uh, in beds that are in a hallway. They should have their own room, but they're in a hallway. Many more people waiting to get beds that cannot be placed. And so can you tell uh, the unfiltered viewers kind of what's happening at the level of our hospitals here locally uh, with this tridemic and the other things that are, that are impacting your business? Mute, Michelle. We really want to hear you, so hit that mute, hit that. Uh, Michelle, you're on mute button. She's trying. To... Oh no. No. Hmm. Yeah, so hit that mute, hit that. Uh oh. Okay. <clears throat> While we're waiting for Michelle to unmute, let's get let's go uh, back to David. Let's go back to David. I had a, Why don't you, you ask mind if I had go. a Okay, hey, all right. So we're gonna work on Michelle. We're gonna get the we're the gonna get the yeah, we're gonna get the technology to talk to Michelle. But David, right as you know, right in your last final comments, you talked about other hospitals here in the Central Valley. And 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 when I was making my phone calls after I heard of this pending problem. I found out that there's three or four other hospitals that are really suffering and that the Madeira was kind of the canary in the, in the coal mine type of, they were the ones that first said, hey, we're not successful. We can't make this happen. We tried. Uh, there's not enough money here. We're losing. We've got to shut down. And what you mentioned is there's probably other hospitals right in line there. And we might see other hospitals experience a shutdown within the next 6, 12, 18 months. Uh, can you expound on that a little bit? Uh, certainly. There's uh, what we're tracking just throughout the entire state. There's probably about 10 hospitals who we really believe are at risk of a closure. Um, those hospitals aren't local to the Central Valley, uh, which is um, thankful for the residents who are here. But these factors have come to bear. What we are seeing, though, and, and even locally, uh, some hospitals have had to uh, actually do layoffs and cut staff and cut benefits at the time when you would think that that's the last thing we should do because so many people need care. But all of the people who need care coming in through the door and go back to, to what I was saying about how, how these reimbursement mechanisms really work, we're not getting, the hospitals aren't covering the cost of that care. And so more patients doesn't mean suddenly all of the numbers make sense. So something's broken then um, in the way that we're doing our, our reimbursements. And so, you know, what we're seeing right now in Tulare County is there's been layoffs at a time when we really need hospitals uh, have capacity. So it's happening left and right. This is um, just on a statewide basis, over half of the hospitals in the state of California are in the red last year. Um, we are, they're losing money um, and, and our valley is not immune to that. Big fix. That's what Mike and I want to know. You talked about resetting the rates. You know, it's crazy that the rates that are being paid out to hospitals were set in 2012. That's ridiculous, right? I mean, just if the rates were set in 2017, we'd have a problem. But that's why I said Big Pharma has got a bigger yeah. lobby than hospitals. Well, they have a bigger, a better lobby, sure. And, yeah, and, they and, and, throwing more money at politicians. I'm going to go back to our loyal uh, viewer, Inga, who I think is a retired nurse. nurse. Uh, it, it, her question, administrative cost of hospitals has increased so much with the regulations placed on them by government and insurance. Is that correct? And <clears throat> is that true? In other words, the hospitals are getting choked by regulation from both government and insurance companies. Could you comment on that? So 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll comment just general on regulations. Um, there, particularly in California, we work in an environment with an incredible amount of regulations and all of David, California is one of the least. <laughs> is that what you said, Steve? No, no regulation. Regulated. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, keep no, going. No. We have this incredibly heavily regulated industry. Um, every year there's new things that, that we have to comply with as hospitals, and there's no way to fund them. Uh, uh, so, for example... Um, one of the big things, which this show isn't about uh, tonight, is we have seismic mandates to comply with that the cost goes into the tens of billions of dollars statewide, and there's not a mechanism to, to fund it. Um, and these things are happening left and right. So the hospital administrative cost to comply with regulations, that that's very real. Um, and then, you know, I'm talking about reimbursements, the really the biggest driving factor what has caused this issue is a shortage of local nurses, and this is statewide, where we're bringing in staff through these travel registries, and we're paying um, sometimes three times, sometimes four times as much as a regular staff nurse will be earning. And so suddenly the labor costs have gone through the roof, and that's, that's really the most unsustainable, um, and there's no way to get reimbursed for that higher cost. Bring Michelle, I think our audio is <clears throat> back on. The seismic issues is really important. It's going to have billions of dollars of cost, something that probably should be done. But typically in California, that's what uh, we do. Government comes out with regulation, very difficult to roll out, not well thought out. Mm -hmm. And then they expect industry, or in this case, nonprofits such as the hospitals, to figure out and solve the problem. Kind of reminds me, you know what, auto industry in the United States in the 70s. Mm -hmm. They would put out a car and let the warranty and the service department and the consumer figure out what the deal with all the problems, figure and that's where the Japanese came in and actually blew out uh, the American auto industry. If it wasn't because of restrictions and some mild tariffs, <clears throat> the big three would probably be out of business. You know, before we were, the show started, I was walking the halls here, and you have this wonderful picture of our old courthouse, the same in yeah. downtown Fresno. And that was torn down because of seismic restrictions, and it took them forever to tear it down because it was built so well. And it's amazing. They destroy our history. They destroy, they create problems. And it's, it's, yeah. so, you know, what do they say? The road, the road, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right. And it's really that's unfortunate. That's How, right. You talk about the V, oh, real quick. VMT, something we talk about in this show, how it impacts healthcare in the Valley. I'm going to tie that in. Yeah. Vehicle miles traveled. I'm trying to work with another company. It's a local nonprofit, federally funded, to build in Pinedale, in the heart of Pinedale, at Bullard and Herndon, to build a federally funded health clinic that has an optometrist there, x-ray machine, a pharmacy. It's a game changer for that area. Because of VMT... We couldn't. We, we have been delayed over a year on this project. It's a policy created to curb growth out of Sacramento. But that's that was VMT. Vehicle miles traveled. What does that what mean? What they are trying to what, basically, it's a scoring system. So we have a map that you, planners look at. There's yellow, red, and green, and this is a red zone because they're claiming people will drive to this clinic within the neighborhood and create pollution doing that even though they're going to walk to the clinic instead of driving to St. Agnes, and that reduces the demand on the ER at St. Agnes to have this clinic right there in Pinedale. Because for a lot of folks, the that's ER right. is the primary care physician, which is terrible. That that's hurts right. us big time. You're a, that's a great point, Mike. That's a, that's a great Michelle point. Now. Okay, Michelle. Let's get Michelle on. All right. Uh, Steve, you had a question for Michelle. All right, Michelle, are you with us now? I think so. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Thank, thank goodness. All right. But David, don't go too far. Michelle, today at the County Board of Supervisors, uh, we voted to um, put in a, uh, a state of emergency. One of the main reasons was um, you guys over at Community were asking us behind the scenes in our departments about that. You even came and made your case uh, today at the Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, we learned a lot of different things about what's happening at Community, which is one of our big healthcare players in our community. So it's so when you speak, you know we're all ears. We heard about um, patients being out in the hallways on beds but being treated in the hallways of the hospital. We heard of other patients waiting to be admitted to the hospital and um, having a difficult time with a throughput, moving patients who had a surgery last week, uh, moving them through the hospital to make room for another patient with a more critical need this week. And so we heard of a bunch of different 
situations. Can you expand on that a little bit and talk to us about how declaring a state of emergency helps community? And then, you know, what are some of the big picture fixes that you uh, feel need to happen? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to thank you, um, Supervisor Brandau and the whole board of supervisors, because we we really appreciate your leadership today and, and your support. I think really what it does for us and not just community, um, but all of the hospitals in the area, but what it does is it gets the attention of, of the state um, we have been um, requesting additional resources from the state and the federal government. And so by um, the county declaring a local state of emergency, um, I think it, it really does demonstrate that uh, we, need, we need the extra help. So um, that's what we're hoping for. Um, we've, we've been in conversations uh, starting last last night uh, through today on trying to get additional resources and really in the way of um, additional physicians, additional nurses um, that could come um, to the valley. And, you know, one of the things that I've really um, uh, understood uh, more so in the last three years is that really the hospitals um, here in our area are really connected. So um, what is um, plaguing community regional medical center, you know, spills over into the other hospitals. I mean, we, we, um, we work together and um, when one hospital is impacted, you know, really all the hospitals are impacted. And, you know, we're seeing that with the closure of Madera Community Hospital. Yeah, and then this, so declaring the emergency and by the way, Michelle, I've got, in all reality up there among the five supervisors, I was the hardest sell because I just I just do not like to declare emergencies unless I convinced it's a real emergency. And I see a lot of agencies and a lot of municipalities declaring emergencies and it's really not an emergency. So I, I'm a little worried about that. The boy that cried wolf a scenario. But after hearing from some of the problems that are happening currently and being exacerbated by the closure of Madeira, I think declaring an emergency was probably the right thing to do. But Michelle, here's my problem and here's where my questions are at. Most of the things that I heard about today, they pre-existed the Madeira closure and yes. the type of throughput problems at the hospital and the, the, the folks being treated out in the out in the um, hallways, all of that pre-existed the Madera closure. So what are the ongoing, what are the fixes that need to happen to really change the dynamic for the you know strategy of healthcare here in the Valley? Oh gosh. <laughs> well, David, David mentioned, uh, you know, David mentioned several of them. Um, I, I would just say, um, I, I just have to put a plug in for um, really all healthcare workers and all physicians. Um, but, but, you know, today, and I don't know if it's this way for every hospital, but today we could, we could feasibly open more beds, but it's really the staff that we don't have um, to care for those patients uh, who would be in those beds. So that is really, um, I would say, probably the number one concern right now um, is just, you know, and then you bring COVID and the flu and RSV. I mean, it affects not only our patients, but our workforce. So we have, you know, a couple hundred um, employees that are, that are out sick who can't come to work. Um, and that makes a huge difference. So I think, you know, really um, labor has been a huge issue. Um, some of what, I mean, David mentioned in reimbursement, that's very, very true, but there's a huge shortage um, in nurses and physicians, particularly in this area. Um, so I would say if I had to point to one thing today, it's, it's uh, staffing shortages. So a real quick question then, and, and this might not apply, it's just the way I think about it is, were we able to pick up some of those folks from Madera 
that are now looking elsewhere with the closure of that hospital. So that's kind of a low hanging. Maybe we can grab 25 or 40 percent of those folks before they go out somewhere in the wider world. And then in my investigation leading up to my vote today, I, I had asked a few people and I guess there's another a jam up again. And maybe you could help me out with the detail about these traveling nurses and the cost of traveling nurses is starting to be very cost prohibitive for these hospitals to be able to afford these traveling nurses. And, and in the beginning of this traveling nurse situation, um, you know, it was like, hey, let's find a nurse in um, Texas or a, a nurse in South Dakota that's not working and, and, and bring them in because we're having an emergency. Now I'm understanding that, you know, people are applying for traveling nurses. They're coming in from Tulare or Merced, and the, the game has kind of changed a little bit. So could you help me out with some of that? And, and, and traveling nurses, from what I understand, make over $200,000 a year. And, uh, you know, I can do sutures. <laughs> Is it too late for me? No. It's too late for me? Okay. <laughs> but but there's, it, it'll take you several years to get into a nursing school because right. California doesn't build nursing schools. Okay, sorry about that. Michelle? Well, I, I yeah, will I, I will say this, I, and, and David might be a, a little bit better person to, to answer these questions, but yes, uh, during the height of, of uh, the pandemic, um, we did get waivers from the state. Um, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's different criteria from state to state. Um, and so we were able to get waivers from the state to pull in those, uh, those out-of-state nurses. Um, otherwise, there's, you know, really um, to get licensed in California is different uh, than to get licensed in, you know, other states uh, across the nation. So we did have those waivers at one at one time, um, but but those those types of waivers expire after after a while, and so um, we aren't able to bring in out of state nurses like we were. You need instead of. Inga got a question. Uh, instead of open borders, we should, you know, <clears throat> recruit nurses. How about if you had open borders on nurses? In other words, if you're a nurse, yeah, come on, find nurse. If you, if, yeah. you, if you can get uh, certified, of course, yeah, absolutely. Get certified, but the, uh, our immigration laws don't allow brainy anybody, including brainy people, that we really need. Yeah, to immigrate. Well, you're not allowed so, in. So you're not allowed in. <laughs> but. And, and and also Corinne Peters yeah. on has talked about opening up more resident slots for doctors, right? So the number of nurses and doctors are constricted in America well, artificially well, look, by the AMA and other groups. Right. They want to artificially constrict the number of people that go into that workforce. Yeah, having I mean, a, having a, the, no, the absolutely. That. Yeah, like having a new medical school here in the valley. The great thing is you bring people from here or outside and hopefully get them to stay here by having the residences here. That's big. It's huge for our area. We're, we're we have a big medical deficit. But I want to talk to you guys about uh, ER wait times. If we can do that for a moment and get Michelle's feedback yeah, on that. Go for it. The reason I want to talk about that. Okay, you had a, there's a slide earlier with a picture of a very beautiful child. <laughs> I think using a nebulizer, getting a, a breathing treatment, and that's what it's all about. That's the biggest fear. If I'm a parent and my little child, whether it's a life-threatening or even a flu or something, you want to go to the doctor. Now, I'm not a medical person. I don't know triage. But for me, it's the biggest issue of the time. Now, trying to find out what the average wait time is in this country is very difficult because there's all kinds of sources out there. I've been able to find out D.C. is the worst, South Dakota is the best, and the average is about two and a half hours. But... Certain it's websites claim here it's even worse. And there's now I'm not saying it's credible. One website's claiming CRMC's five six hours, but now we're we're dealing with the triple threat. And my my question is, what can be done to reduce this problem? Let's talk about Medicare for a moment. So rates are set by the senator centers for Medicare and Medicaid services, and I guess they've been delayed on adjusting the rates. You're going to get paid the same for a broken leg at CRMC that St. Agnes gets paid by Medicare. But how can they incentivize you to invest in technology or reward you if you have shorter wait times because you're doing a better job? That's what we do in the business world. Why isn't the government doing that with this problem here? They're just treating you the same even if you're better at the problem. Um, are there any incentives? What can policymakers do to actually help exacerbate the overall issue of wait times in the ER? Well, wait, well, wait times, that's a lot to unpack um, for, for, you know, what, what I tell my family and friends, let's say, is, 
you know, the emergency department is not like your doctor's office, obviously. It's not kind of a first come, first serve. There's no appointments. It's all about the acuity of the patient, right? So, um, you know, the, the more urgent the situation, the more life-threatening, um, the, you know, the sooner you're going to be seen. Um, so unfortunately, that, that means that there are long waits for, for others that, um, that don't come in with as urgent of, of, a, of a medical issue. So, um, you know, I think incentivizing, gosh, um, you know, due to, due to wait times, it's just, it's so, it's so difficult because, you know, hospitals are impacted differently. Um, you know, we have, we have tents. Um, we sometimes will triage, uh, you know, we have a triage area um, in, in our emergency departments where you don't really even go back to um, the emergency area if you, if you don't need to. So um, it just works, it works a lot differently. I mean, there's just no way we can um, anticipate the volumes we're going to get at any given time um, through the emergency department. So it's, it just is really, is really difficult. Um, there, I'm sorry, I, I have a question for you. Actually, I don't know if <clears throat> Steve's question got answered. Uh, are you hiring? Uh, and if so, what percentage of Madeira hospital nurses and physicians are you looking at hiring? And, <clears throat> and is there any discussion about purchasing Madeira community. I know there's several investors. This was an article out, I believe it was today on GB Wire, that are looking at purchasing Madeira community. Any thoughts on that, on both of those, hiring some of their staff uh, as they're closing their doors and, and also or purchasing and or operating Madeira community? Um, yeah, well, you know, we, we certainly are. I mean, we're, we're I, I, I believe that we are in, interviewing um, you know, several of uh, Madeira community um, employees. Um, and so we we would love to get whoever is interested in, on board as soon as possible. I think probably all the hospitals in the area are are um, would be willing and and uh, anxious to to get a lot of those um, uh, new employees on board. So yes, the answer is yes to that. Um, as far as as far as purchasing or operating Madeira, um, you know that's a very complicated situation. It's a complicated issue. We would have to, you know, really look at that, and you know, unfortunately, to really um, to really consider that would 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 take months. And um, I think, unfortunately, time has run out. Can I follow up my question? Please, uh, with Michelle or with uh, Michelle. David? Okay. And, and David, if you want to chime in. Michelle, let me put it this way. If I'm Kevin McCarthy and I'm going to be the next Speaker of the House, possibly, and I say, Michelle, I want to help this issue of wait times in your hospitals, despite everything, how can I help you? What would you tell the Speaker of the House? That's a great question. Have you talked to Kevin recently? <laughs> okay. Um, this is the D, D next to my name. It is like my call. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it's broader than wait times. I, I I really do. I think it's there's a lot of critical things happening, but for me, right. see, I, I understand what you're talking about with urgent and not urgent. But if it's my child or my elderly father or me with the flu, even though it's not, not, not COVID, for me, it's the biggest issue I have. So wait times do matter overall. So I'm asking on this one issue that's important to folks, how can we reduce wait times in hospitals? Is there any information? What would you tell the speaker? I get it. There's a million other issues. But what can the federal government do to ease that burden and help you guys reduce wait times? Well, I I do think it's I do think it's staffing. Um, however, but it, but it's it's also beds. Um, I think um, Supervisor Brandau uh, heard today we have too many patients in the ED. We had earlier um, 80 patients um, the last time I checked, 80 patients in the emergency department that are waiting for beds. Um, and so, you know, we can't keep taking patients. There's only so much room. There's only so much staff. Um, so it's it's a variety of things. I think staffing capacity. We need more nurses. We need more. We need more physicians, um, and and that would help us open more beds. 
Um, it's not the only solution, but um, we're, we're just inundated with, with really more patients than we can handle sometimes. Got it. Thank you. Yep, staffing and, uh, and the beds, the capacity. Get it. I got it. See, Mike, this is one of the things that I found out, you know, and, and it's, you know, in my job, we were talking about this a couple years ago, then other things change. We start talking about other issues. Going back to this, one of the problems that I have with it is that, as, as Michelle and David both talked about, there's so many different um, on ramps onto the problem that we have in healthcare, right? This David first talk, start talking about all the rates were set in 2012. Right. Well, you know what my house cost in 2012 <laughs> compared right. to what it costs now? I mean, it's ludicrous to right. think that we can expect a successful business model for the hospitals at those reimbursement rates, right? So that's just one tiny part of sure. it. So we could we could talk to Kevin McCarthy or whoever yeah. about that, you know, and then and then the the hiring and and the cost of bringing in the right number of people and capacity building, right? So well, capacity building, right? So there has been so much investment in downtown Fresno through CRMC, um, and the idea of building another tower. Here's the dilemma: seismic rules. It costs way more to build a new building, and how are they going to do that? I mean, and are, when these rules were established. Was it based on actual data or science, or was it a lobbyist that knew a certain elected official and then pushed them to increase these new standards for their own means? I mean, who, who gets paid out of that? Because in the end, it costs, this, this hospital has to make money. What happens when you don't make money? You shut down like Madera community. Right. So. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> David, any comments? Uh, we, actually, we don't need this on the screen. We, if you can just put up David and uh, Michelle on, that'd be great. Um, okay, we sorry we have some technical difficulties. Uh, David, any comments on um, what Michelle just talked about? I think that uh, Michelle's describing uh, what we are seeing all over the place, and I think there's really a two prong two prongs to this issue. One is there's incredible patient volumes right now. So many people are sick. And, and the state of emergency and, and what's happened with uh, communities request that really benefits everyone is help us now, help send people now, help us get through this. And then the second prong is this longer term. All of these things that we're describing are such long-term fixes. And so the second part is please don't look away when the surge ends and we're no longer at our knees because there's structural things that we need to fix. Um, and the last thing is I did see someone's comment saying, please don't bash the travel nurses. They got us through COVID. Yes, uh, we are so thankful for all of our medical personnel and our travel nurses who really have helped us out. Um, specifically agencies, because it's an employment service, have a markup on that. And that's that cost is what, what has become unbearable. Uh, but those nurses, the people who helped, amazing, thank you. Uh, all of us owe you a huge debt of gratitude. We're at the top of the hour. We need to wrap up. Um, we're going to get closing comments on this. But uh, cup, uh, Mike, you have something you want to share that's coming up on Thursday at City Hall? Yeah, so we're talking about states of emergency. Well, you hear about housing, and there's an item before us to declare a housing state of emergency in Fresno. So, you know, 2023 is getting off to an interesting start. We're getting hit by a lot of things. Um, but again, with housing, VMT, state policies. What is keeping us from being able to build more hospitals, have more capacity, attract more qualified individuals, have more residencies, and then build uh, build on more land? I mean, let's not forget, in the state of California, 95% of us live on 5% of the land. It's not a land issue. It's a government policy issue. D Steve, you mentioned the drought. Is You think it's partially human, man-made. I think this housing shortage is definitely man and woman made it's people made it's sacramento made and um hopefully we're, you know we're running against the current here in fresno but we'll see what happens with this state of emergency if we actually get more housing built okay uh, a couple of quick things before we go to back to michelle <clears throat> i'm gonna put this slide on the on the screen what california must learn from this wave of storms and this is uh highway 99 if i were, yeah yeah near Lowe wow Lowe. Yeah. south of sacramento south sacramento county County. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And then one of the laws that went into effect um, Sunday, so you can jaywalking becomes legal. Um, 
I'm in sorry. Many I, states. I think that's stupid. Look, um, I'm a driver, and uh, I think that there are certain rules. Like if I jaywalk. I'm, I'm taking my life in my own hands because people are on their phones texting, not paying attention. And now we're legalizing jaywalking. And the idea is it's restorative justice. Look, we have rules to keep people safe. You know, you have rule. You, I mean, we wear a seatbelt. Uh, how, how about no seatbelts, Darius? Let's get rid of it. I, I think I, about it. It hurts me. It constricts me. I don't want a seatbelt anymore. You bring up you know? a good point. I have a, I, we need to get some lawyers on this one of these shows. So does that mean if you hit somebody that's jaywalking, cannot be sued? Or do you can you sue the state no of California? Idea. So there are still know. some rules, from what I read from the analysis. I mean, you can't. There are still some safety issues, but I don't. That's a great question. We should get it. We should oh, get a lawyer do that on that next week. Let's yeah. look at these new laws. New laws, including the yeah. reparations. Okay, Is that, that went on through? the table still. That's on the table. I think. Oh, yeah, Ingrid just reminded us uh, preparing a rollout of the reparations program. We should probably put that on the screen. Let's go, to, let's go to Michelle. Get her closing Michelle. comments and thoughts. <clears throat> Michelle, are you with us? Yes. 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 <laughs> uh, final comments. Uh, well, I, I just want to shout out to all of the, and anyone really taking care of patients, um, um, certainly at community health system, but anyone taking care of patients, um, whether you're a nurse or a physician or, um, you know, part of that care team, uh, we just really, really appreciate you. Um, I think you're angels and scrubs. You're doing God's work. Um, so God bless you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, and Michelle. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. And any other co comments from David? I think, or did we are are we wrapped up on your end? Nothing. Nothing for me. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Mike and uh, Steve, you get the last word. Mike, sure. Look, I just want to thank both of our guests for being here. Uh, for our residents, for those watching, I say residents because <laughs> as a council member, but for folks watching tonight that live in Fresno and Clovis, here's the issue. We talked tonight about the speaker. The next speaker of the House, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, if it's somebody that represents this area, we're going to probably get more money to invest in infrastructure and critical things like health care. So it is in our interest to elect someone locally as the next speaker of the House. It'd be a big, big deal for us. On the issue of health mm. and Madera community closing, <clears throat> especially if you live in northwest Fresno, you're kind of in the middle of downtown trauma, level one trauma center community hospital and St. Agnes. And you're concerned about we have a lot of seniors in our district being able to have a heart attack, God forbid, getting an ambulance to be able to get get help, get, get care and, and, and do it in a quick enough time, have a quick, quick enough response time. So it's something that I'm really worried about because you're worried about that too. But what happens at the state, not just on direct health care issues, but even planning issues, affect us locally. So when we have this show to get you guys to listen to inform you about bigger issues statewide – it's because they affect us every day critically. And now we're in the trenches, you know, thanks to the Board of Supervisors for declaring this emergency. But we are playing catch up because others have caused burdens to fall upon us. So that's what we're doing here at GV Wire, increasing awareness so that we're more informed as voters and elected officials and business leaders. And thank you for watching. Thank you, Mike. Steve? So my closing comments are a little bit different, and, I, and this doesn't reflect anything on David or Michelle. I think they're doing a great job, and uh, I'm glad they were on unfiltered with us tonight. But here's what I'm seeing. You know, we're at uh, COVID plus three years, right? 36 months after COVID. We're coming up on that. Maybe we haven't quite reached it yet, but essentially around the three-year mark. <clears throat> and you, we have got to start asking ourselves as a society, did we learn a damn thing, mm -hmm. Right. What, what are we doing different with, with <clears throat> our systems? You know, tonight we're discussing a healthcare system. It doesn't seem like much has changed since we've had this similar request 24 months ago. And, but I, but it's beyond, it's not just healthcare. It's our education system, right? We saw our kids go through crisis. Have we done anything about that? I don't see anything. Right. How about government? I'm in government. Mike, you're in government. Have we done anything different? Have we made it? No, we're still vulnerable because we're still doing the same old stuff, right? And I think, and I have a big problem with that government, the, uh, the education system, the healthcare system and other systems, right? Need to do a reevaluation and we need to have a grand reimagining on some level on some of these systems, right? Because if not, we're just going to have another COVID. The hospitals are always going to be slammed. That's going to become the new normal. 
Nothing's going to change. More people are not going to reach the doctor in a timely fashion. It's it's nuts, <clears throat> you know. And and the same applies. I'm, I'm I'm not trying to turn up the heat on our guest tonight, but the same applies for government <coughs> itself and our education system. Have we did we learn anything? Have we done a dramatic reorg? of any part of these strategies, right? I haven't seen it, so no. that's my concern. Fair. Well put, Steve. <clears throat> my final thoughts, uh, I want to echo, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Mike, but I want to echo uh, Mike's thoughts on uh, Kevin McCarthy as becoming our next speaker. Uh oh, we have a, a okay. Um, uh, becoming our next speaker of the house. He's a, a Californian. And there'll be a lot of light uh, shed on Central California, if you, in, in my opinion, if he becomes, if he becomes a speaker. Um, and he represents uh, North Fresno. So I'm very excited about that if, if he does become speaker. And I, I certainly would put all my votes, uh, all my uh, zero votes, but all my support in helping uh, or uh, supporting Kevin McCarthy becoming our next speaker. Um, in terms of our healthcare system, it's really, <coughs> excuse me, unfortunate that California, as the fourth largest economy in the world, we have one of the worst education systems, and we cannot solve our health care problems. The fact that our hospitals are regulated and they can't raise dollars and they can't raise their fees or adjust uh, adjust their uh, financial systems, or it's based on 2012 numbers. I mean, that's just outrageous. Uh, cost of health care continues to go up. And I'm not an expert. I don't know. Is it big pharma? Is it services? Whatever it is, uh, is it insurance companies? But uh, we we have in, in the fourth largest economy in the world, we can't get to an emergency room uh, and get in and, and get taken care of. We can't address so many of the needs of of, of our of our residents and and citizens in our in our state. And and to me, a lot of it is uh, the regulatory envir environment in the state of California. Uh, one of the commenters uh, talked about we need residency so we can get more doctors. And how do we attract more nurses from all over the world, by the way? Um, I'm not opposed to paying $200,000 plus for traveling nurses. More power to them. By the way, several of them are buying our homes or renting our very cool looking uh, condos. But um, we, we need to have uh, better solutions from government. Government has a lot of mandates. And they expect the private or the nonprofit sector, in, in some of these cases, to fix all their bugs. The government needs to do a better job thinking the regulations before they roll it out. Whether it's VMT, as Mike talked about earlier, on the education component or on the healthcare. And if you want to maintain our position as the fourth largest economy in the world, we really, our citizens and residents deserve better uh, regs and legislation from government. On behalf of all of us at uh, GV Wire, I want to thank you for watching. Thank you to our uh, guests, Michelle and David, for joining us this evening. And we hope to get you both back on as this uh, hospital crisis unfolds and we get to hopefully some great solutions uh, for us in Central California. Have a great evening, everybody. Happy New Year and see you all next Tuesday.